Welcome to the Frugalpreneur Podcast. I am your host, Sarah St. John, and my guest today has been featured in Forbes and has a top-ranking podcast called All Ears English, which gets 8 million downloads per month. Welcome to the show, Lindsay McMahon. Thanks, Sarah. I'm excited to be here. Well, I'm so excited to have you. I know I just briefly covered about you, but I'd love to hear more of your backstory and how you got into podcasting, but also your specific podcast. Absolutely. Happy to tell my story. So I, you know, I was a podcast listener back in 2013 when the only podcasts that existed at that time were kind of techie podcasts or like self-improvement, personal development type business building, very indie projects. And I got excited about it from there. At the same time, I had kind of a career budding in ESL, English as a second language, teaching, so education, language training. I had lived in Japan and South America, had taught English in these places, and the two passions kind of came together, right? Language learning, language teaching, and podcasting. And I decided one day, hey, why not start a podcast? And so I recruited another teacher who lived in Boston at the time that I knew. And I said, do you want to start a podcast? And she said, yeah. So we did it. I mean, it was pretty, pretty, a very simple beginning, I guess. Oh, awesome. So what were you doing in Japan? Like, did you go over there to teach or? Yeah, exactly. So I got the job from the U.S. I went there to teach English. I worked for Eon Corporation, which is an English training company, right? I taught people anywhere from age three up to age 85. So all different ages, different demographics in the city of Tokyo. So then your podcast, All Ears English, is that teaching people how to speak English or what exactly is your podcast? Yeah, exactly. So our demographic, who we target is international professionals, global professionals, adults who are either doing business in English. So that means they may have immigrated to the U.S., Canada, Australia, the U.K., or they're living in their home country, Japan, Taiwan, Brazil, but they need to learn English, whether it's for their career or whether it's for their life or just a hobby. But many of them do need it sometimes at work. So the stakes are pretty high in that case. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Because, I mean, I know that there's you know, different apps and books and all this on learning English, but it sounds like this is specifically for business people. Yeah. I mean, I would say that when you teach adults English as a second language, the vast majority, their career is going to be impacted if they can improve their English. So for many of them, it goes beyond just a hobby. Yeah, and I'd love to hear about how you get 8 million downloads or 100,000 per episode and were awarded one of the best of Apple podcasts. How do you get the word out (laughs) there? What is the story there? So right now we're hovering around 7 million, but yeah, it does fluctuate, right? Depending on the season, you know, summer tends to be a little slower. People are at the beach. They're not focusing on their English, but we're seeing a little bit of a fall bump up at this point this week. So anyway, 7, 8 million in that range. How did we do it? First of all, I want to make sure it's clear, you know, we launched in a time that, you know, right time, right place. There is some aspect of right time, right place with our launch. This was 2014, 13, right? The app store, the Apple podcast store, Spotify, Spotify wasn't even in podcasting yet. And it was just a much less crowded environment. So that's not to say someone can't do that today. They can, but it was a little smoother for us in 2013 than I think it would be now, 2022, 2023. But that being said... We work like crazy here at All Ears English. So it's a combination of good branding, smart branding, a personalized approach that was refreshing for our market. So it's understanding your market a little bit, knowing what the gaps are. We filled that gap in our style of teaching, which is much more conversational and natural than what most ESL teachers, frankly, were doing at that time. So we put our faces on our cover art. We talked about our our lives a little bit, intertwined that with the English teaching. That was new and novel. And then we publish four days a week. So when you publish that much content and it does that well every day for nine years, you end up being able to continue your success. Oh, wow. And then you were also in Forbes magazine. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so that was an article that was written back in December of last year. So I was working with one of the editors of the magazine, but she was looking for content on podcasting, how to launch a podcast. Podcasting is kind of hot right now. 
And so she interviewed me and was able to cover, you know, my background. And yeah, I was honored to have that, have that placement. So for someone who is interested in getting into like a Forbes or an Entrepreneur Inc. or whatever, how do you recommend go? Like in your case, was it like you signed up for Help a Reporter Out or something and you got... No. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't that. So actually it was about being in the right networks and seeing what's needed. So similar to Help a Reporter Out, I was a member and still am of a group that's called the Dynamite Circle, which is a group of location independent entrepreneurs. They have meetups around the world, but I just joined for the mastermind groups and for the forums, just questions and answers. And that writer posted in that group, she said, hey, I'm looking for content on podcasting. I'm looking to feature someone on podcasting. And so I said, hey, I can write an article for you. Here it is. I jumped on it right away, banged out that article, and we worked on it together on editing it throughout the fall. And it was what she needed at that moment. And I jumped on it. So making sure you're in the right circles so you can catch wind of these things, right? And then acting fast, right? If I had waited two weeks and oh, maybe I'll respond, maybe I'll let her know I have some content, I have a channel. No, someone else would have done it. But instead I wrote it that morning. It was like a Monday morning. I was like, oh, I have so many things to do. I'm just going to write this article. I'm just going to see how, like, if she, you know, if this works. So action taking, right? And one of the things that I know you talk about are the three tactics to convert listeners to customers. Mm -hmm. Can you go over that? Some of the things that we do that works well right now are quizzes. So it's especially easy in education. Well, it's it's easy and hard. So in education, a lot of people are looking for free content. So that part is hard because you, you need to convert your free content into a course or into some kind of a paid program if you want to pay your staff, pay your team, pay your payroll and keep your website running. So the question is, how do you do that? Some of the mechanisms using a quiz, people love quizzes. Like how many horoscope quizzes have you taken? How many personality tests have we taken? We love it. Why? Because it tells us something about us. That's a, an important thing to remember throughout all of your marketing. I think for your listeners, this could be a value, a piece of value for them. Everything you do, always think about your person, like the people you want to reach. We, we create in our podcast what we call what's in it for me with thems, where at the very beginning of the episode, we say, this is what you're going to get. And this is why it matters for you. And we bring it out to connection and, and human values and things we want beyond just language proficiency, right? So a quiz gives us a bit of that too, because we learn about ourselves. So we find that that works well as a conversion top of the funnel lead magnet. And then you can drive listeners to a webinar. You can drive them to a sales page. You can remarket to them. You can do a lot of things. And then also, I know branding is yeah. important, and that's one thing that you talk about. I went to your website, and it is very everything. It's like what yellow and black is all kind of, it all flows well. What tips do you have for branding? I think, yeah, don't skimp on branding. You know, think about, I think colors are huge. Think about how colors make people feel. Think about the cultures. You're, so if we're doing international marketing, think about the cultures and what these colors might mean in different cultures. Think about what pops. That is one of the things, that is one of the reasons among all the other reasons of 2013 and consistency of why we've done well over the years and continue to do well today. You know, when I look in the Apple Podcast Store, our branding still pops. That yellow very much pops. If everyone becomes yellow with their cover art, we'll have to become some other color, right? Change it entirely. But if you have like darker colors, maybe that works for your industry and your brand vibe, but people aren't going to notice you. So do things that are noticeable. Use your own personality, your face. Use colors that work. Use fonts that resonate with what you're trying. You know, make a splash. Don't be scared to be expressive in your branding. That's what I would say. And make sure that it matches across the board as well. <laughs> yeah. And call, I know it's, it's a constant challenge because as entrepreneurs, we're using tools like lead pages, click funnels, opt-in monster. And the, it's not like those tools know your branding. It's not like they're like, oh, this is your template. These are your fonts. This is how things are. This is your cascading CSS file. No, no, no. You have to try to make it match up. And I've had a lot of frustration on that over the years. But as much as you can, we did a redesign of our website in 2020. There were parts of this redesign I wasn't happy with. I wasn't necessarily happy with the company we hired. 
but they did spruce up our site and we needed it at that time, right? They created a cohesive look and feel to the pages. So investing in website redesigns when it's needed. And I love that you mentioned about how the podcast cover art is yellow and pops when you're looking in Apple Podcasts or wherever, because I think that's an important thing to keep in mind is that, well, first of all, definitely recommend having one solid color background and then yeah. maybe like one image or whatever, not don't overwhelm it and have a million different things going on. But yeah, picking a color that or, or a design period that pops when someone's scrolling, because a lot of times that's how people actually find you or listen to you is that it catches their eye. So I think that's pretty important. It's the first thing they need to, first of all, it needs to catch their eyes. You said they need to stop scrolling. And then there's like a split second where they look at you and they say, is this for me? You ha the answer has to be yes. It's a combination of beautiful design and simple design that communicates immediately what this show does. And that goes for beyond just podcast cover art, right? It goes for your website, emails, everything. I'm learning more about how important that kind of thing is. Like, because the first step really with a podcast or a book is just for someone to stop the scroll. <laughs> It really is. And it it's so sad, right? It's kind of sad because it really doesn't matter how great your content is, how much expertise you have, and how much you will help that person if they don't stop the scroll and they don't open your book or download your podcast or follow your podcast. It's sad, but it's true. So invest in good design and then, you know, improve it as you go along, right? It doesn't mean you need to hire a $100,000 designer when you first launch a show or a brand. It means you need to have good design and then you level up as you go. Another thing you talk about is creating a unique value proposition. Can you explain to people who, who might not know what that means? Yeah, so this is kind of marketing jargon, but this goes back a little bit to, I was really inspired by Simon Sinek's talk on Start With Why. I don't know if you ever saw that, Sarah, on YouTube. It went viral back in like 2015. Did you ever see that where you have the I, circle? No. Well, I have the book, which I haven't read yet because I've got like a hundred books to read, but oh, read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this kind of got inspired by both Simon Sinek and one other mentor, right? Seth Godin. I've read everything he's written and took a lot of inspiration from him, combining those ideas with my own ideas. In our case, we define value proposition, not in terms of products and services, but in terms of an actual value, like a human value. And what we saw as a gap in the market, and that gap was most ESL teachers, most language companies, trainers, schools teach English or teach the language. We kind of make that connection between, yeah, we're learning language, but we're not here to learn language. We're actually here to learn how to connect as human beings with someone else. And the biggest tragedy in our mind is that language would be the barrier to connection between two human beings, that they could not connect, that someone would be disconnected. I know how it feels from my own experiences learning Spanish, traveling through South America, being on a beach in Colombia and being disconnected because everyone was speaking in Spanish and laughing and I couldn't connect. And that was deeply painful for me. And so every time we create a piece of content, I think of my listeners potentially being in that position and I don't, I want to make sure they're not in that position. So for us, that's what the value proposition is, right? It's not, you know, we're going to do this XYZ product and service and increase your revenue by XYZ. It's more about like what the, what we want as humans. And so that resonates with our listeners in a way that other ESL content or other language content just doesn't go that far. And you say we, is that, is that because of your co-host? Yeah. So I have a team. So yeah. Did you want me to talk about that a little bit? Or? Well, yeah. About like co-hosting because most podcasts are mm -hmm. just one person. So I'd love to hear how co-hosting and collaboration works out. That was another gap that I saw in the market. Most language podcasts are one person speaking to the audience. And to me, nothing against that. That's great, for, especially for other genres, maybe entrepreneurship. That works really well. For me, I would be bored just talking to myself. I need that chemistry of connection between someone else. And for language, training, it makes total sense because our listeners are not going to be talking to themselves. <laughs> They're going to be talking to someone else. And so they want to hear a demonstration and feel uh -huh. inspired by how that connection could happen, that chemistry. So we've always done our show with two co-hosts. 
costs us more. It means I have a payroll as a business owner. It means I have 401ks to match. It means I have PTO, right? I run a real company and I hire people, but it's, first of all, it makes it way more fun, way less lonely. And I think that we've been able to succeed in ways we wouldn't have if it was just a solo show, me just trying to talk to my audience. So we've got two shows right now. So they're, so on the main, the bigger show, the 7 million a month, all ears English podcast, there are two of us. So Michelle, Aubrey, they switch off, but it's always me and one of them. And then we have a second podcast, which is a more niche show, which has two other co-hosts. So we'll always build our shows in that way. It's just an element of our brand. Oh, okay. What's the other show? So it's called IELTS Energy Podcast, and that is actually designed to train our listeners, prepare them for an exam that they have to take if they want to immigrate. So it's an English language exam called the IELTS. So it's a very industry specific thing, but I will always pay more. I'll always have more overhead on my P&L because I do hire, but I think in the end, it's going to build a stronger company. Yeah, there are times where I feel like I need not a co-host for my podcast, but like a co-owner or a co-founder for my business. For your sake of your sanity yeah. of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so when you started the podcast, did you already have a business behind it that you were kind of starting the podcast to help get more exposure for? Or did the podcast start by itself with no business behind it and then that grew because of the podcast. Yeah. So I had a different business at the time. I had a more of a tutoring company model going on. So I would hire teachers in New York and Boston and pay them to, because we had a website and students would come to us, ask for English lessons. So that was a totally different model. I was uninspired by that, but I thought that was going to become my company, my main job, right? Instead, what happened was I launched All Ears English as like a bit of a hobby, a play thing. You know, it was something to play with, to have fun with. We would record on the weekend. It was fun. That became the business, right? So the business grew around All Ears English. So the first thing we started doing was we started selling our transcripts. In ESL, you could sell your transcripts because this adds an enormous amount of value for subscribers. You have an edited, beautiful transcript with branding and it's cohesive and it's delivered in their inbox every Monday morning on time. They don't have to do any work. Yes, you can get transcripts for free. If they enter, they took the MP3, put it in Rev, decided to transcribe. They don't want to do that. You create a nice curated piece of work, they'll pay for it. And they absolutely do. Then we started taking on sponsors about a year in, selling courses and we built an iOS and Android app. So the business really grew around the podcast. I love that transcript idea because, you know, a lot of podcasts, they have transcripts. But for your show in particular, that definitely makes sense. I think it does. I mean, in, in my mind, my definition of business is like, if you create a service that saves people time, and if they're willing to pay for it, you have a business, right? Like it's, you know, most people wouldn't think about that. But that does save people time. Who has the time to go and get something transcribed for themselves? They just don't want to do that. So save time for them. And it's a good investment on their end. Most people, they start a podcast because they already have a business. And the podcast is kind of just another marketing channel. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like, I mean, yeah, you did have another business. But you started a podcast, which then developed into a business. Another business, yeah. Mm -hmm. What tips would you have for someone who is actually starting a podcast for that sole purpose that they want to build a business around a podcast, which generally speaking is probably a little more difficult. What are the best ways for someone to build a business around the podcast? Mm. I actually think that's the better way because you don't have any constraints. Whereas if you're doing the opposite route and you have a business, you've already decided, again, your value proposition, your branding, you kind of have to follow that with the podcast, right? But if you're starting a podcast and that may or may not become a business, you have open reign. So at that point, what I would do is I would look at my market. I know it's way more crowded today than it was in 2013. I get it. It's incredibly harder. But you can still go back to some basic principles of business. What are the gaps in your market? Do you, you know, if your market seems really flooded with the same kind of shows, do you need to niche down further and then expand out once you get your market share, get your share of downloads, right? So go back again, go back to the branding, go back to your 
what are you offering that's different? What's your take? What's your style? If everyone has like a very down to earth approach to your topic, could you have a more comedy based approach? right? Or could you have a co-host approach to people? So think about what's already there and how are you going to, don't just add to what's already there because there's just so much already out there. And then once you have that kind of established, just finding ways to monetize that through, like you said, courses. Yeah. I would worry much. So I would plan on not monetizing for at least six months to a year, probably six to nine months Mm -hmm. because You need to be, so at that point, your currency, your monetization is gaining followers for your show and building your email list. Mm -hmm. Or you even think about launching a product, you have to build your email list. This is still, this has been true in 2013 and it's true now. Because you're not really going to sell, you're not going to have a ton of success selling a product off of a podcast in my experience. What you're going to do is you're going to have them on your email list and you're going to make more sales off selling through your email list. So don't even worry about monetizing until you've built your list. Then you're getting ideas of what product they might want. You survey your audience because they're on your email list. And then you start to think about a unique product. You want to do everything in kind of a methodical way to build trust with the audience. Focus on good content, consistent content, building the audience. Yeah, and then getting them on your email list through, like, in your case, quizzes or... Maybe a free cheat sheet or ebook or whatever it might be. Yes. Something free. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Well, do you have any other general tips, tricks, tactics when it comes to either podcast marketing, podcast monetization, growth, exposure? I think my biggest trick, and it's not a trick at all, it's more like a value. Always keep in mind, just make sure you know why you're in business and why you do what you do. Why does your company exist? And that has to be something that comes from deep, deep, deep inside you. Again, for us, we put a tagline on our value. We put a tagline. The tagline is actually connection, not perfection. And we trademarked that because that immediately when our listeners hear that, they say, oh, yeah, that's me. That's what I want. This is what I've been missing my whole life, learning English, learning languages learning anything. Get in touch with that. You should think about that every day. Every minute you're creating content, you should be coming back to that. If not, then something's wrong. Reevaluate. Because if not, business just stays very surface level and you're not going to get very far. It has to come from deep inside you, especially as an independent business owner. It's late night, a lot of sweat, a lot of stress, a lot going on. You better have a deep reason for doing what you're doing and serving the audience you're serving. And I love that you mentioned tagline. So is that part of All Ears English and then with the tagline or? Yeah, the name of the company is All Ears English and the slogan or the tagline or whatever you want to call it is connection, not perfection. So sometimes in logos, we'll have All Ears English connection, not perfection, right? In that, if it makes sense. We say it in the intro of our podcast, the outro of our podcast, in the episodes, it gets repeated. So it's like a brand experience that comes from a truth that we hold. Yeah, I love that because so my podcast does have a tagline as well. So it's Frugalpreneur, building a business on a bootstrap budget. And in part, that was because, I mean, Frugalpreneur, I think, even though it's a made up word, it's pretty obvious what it is and what it means. But at the same time, I I wanted to have a tagline just in case, plus for SEO and search purposes. But and I'm not seeing a whole lot of people doing taglines, but I kind of feel like a tagline, especially Mm -hmm. if your podcast title is relatively short to begin with, like all ears English or for Goldpreneur, and it's not like a sentence long thing that I don't know. I think a tagline is kind of a useful thing to help further niche down or describe what it is. Well, that's just it, right? Just as we said, I see it as the same thing we just said before. You have to get people to stop scrolling. That's the equivalent in words that they need to stop and say, oh, that's for me. It's the same thing. So we need it in words and we need it visually in the podcast, in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever it is. Do you think, yeah, I think this is something that's overlooked and, you know, why are people not doing it? Maybe it feels like a corporate task, but that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm not talking about like a sentence you put on, you know, on the wall that the companies would put on the the break room, things like that. Not a poster. No, this is something that like you believe in. Like it Mm -hmm. sounds like Sarah, you believe that businesses can be built frugally, right? Mm -hmm. Without spending all of your savings, right? And you believe that deeply for some reason. So people need, if they, they need to say, oh yeah, I I agree with that. And I'm going to consume this content so I can learn how to do it. 
Well, awesome. Well, I appreciate your time today. And people, if they want to check out your podcast, can go to allearsenglish.com. Is that the best place for people to go? Yeah, they can go there. Or if they're already listening to this podcast in Apple Podcasts or Spotify, it might be easier just to go and check out the podcast itself. Just hit the search bar wherever you listen in your podcast app and type in All Ears English and you'll see the yellow. And then I'll have show notes at thesarahstjohn.com forward slash Lindsay, that's L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me on. I've enjoyed our chat.